Hello, I'm Alex, and in this video I'll be explaining a new feature in Intel Advisor 2017 Update 1, Roofline Analysis. Previous experience with Advisor is not strictly necessary, but it is helpful, so I'd like to take a moment to shamelessly self-promote my previous Advisor tutorial videos available online at the Intel Developer Zone. Roofline is a pretty advanced tool that was first proposed by some clever folks at UC Berkeley in a paper called Roofline, an insightful visual performance model for multi-core architectures. It was followed by a second paper from some other smart fellows at the Technical University of Lisbon, Cashaware Roofline Model, Upgrading the Loft, which expanded the model into the form implemented in Intel Advisor 2017. The Roofline helps visualize application performance, both actual and potential, and provides guidance for optimizing your program, if you know how to read it. But of course, that's why I'm here. First, the most basic concepts. You're probably familiar with the idea of floating point operations per second abbreviated as FLOPs, which confusingly sounds identical to the plural of FLOP when spoken aloud, so for clarity's sake, I'm going to always use FLOPs in the latter sense. We do use FLOPs per second in roofline modeling, but we also use something called arithmetic intensity, which is FLOPs per byte accessed. Any given algorithm will have an arithmetic intensity, and in theory, optimization should not change this metric, which is a trait of the algorithm itself. Now, if we make a graph with arithmetic intensity on the x-axis and gigaflops per second on the y-axis, both in logarithmic scale, we can begin to build a roof line. Now, a CPU can only perform so many flops per second. What number that is depends on the CPU, but for any given machine, we can plot a horizontal line on our graph that indicates this maximum. And the memory system of a computer can only supply so many gigabytes per second. Because our x-axis is flops per byte and our y-axis is gigaflops per second, we can plot our memory bandwidth restriction as a diagonal line. This forms the basis of the roofline diagram. Together, these two lines represent the hardware limitations, the machine's maximum achievable performance at a given arithmetic intensity. A given loop or function in a program has a specific algorithm, so it will have a specific arithmetic intensity. When you run it, you can also record how many gigaflops per second it has achieved. Therefore, we can plot it on this graph. Since we generally assume that its algorithm won't change, we can conclude that any optimizations we make will change the performance, but not the arithmetic intensity. It will move up and down, but not side to side, usually. And because we've plotted these roofs that indicate how much performance you could theoretically squeeze out of your machine, we can tell just how far up we can move this dot before we reach a performance cap, and what that cap is. That is the basic idea behind a roofline graph. Of course, it's more complicated than just that. We can plot more lines for different restrictions, such as the bandwidth of different levels of cache, or peak CPU performance for different kinds of operations, such as scalar or vectorized. Suddenly, interpreting the graph isn't quite so simple anymore. I'm going to walk you through Intel Advisor 2017's take on roofline analysis using the sample code. It consists of four groups of loops. Each group has its own unique algorithm and operates on one of two datasets, which differ in size. Group 4 uses the larger dataset, the rest use the smaller one. Within each group, there are multiple loops, which apply different optimizations. Because it's fairly big and commenting out individual loops would be annoying, I've provided a control panel that lets you turn different loops or groups of loops on and off by commenting and uncommenting some pound defines. Quick disclaimer. Because the locations of the roof lines depend on your machine, your mileage may vary. As of Advisor 2017 Update 1, you'll need to set an environment variable before launching Advisor itself. On Windows 10, you can do this by opening the System page of the Control Panel, then using Advanced System Settings, then Environment Variables, and then adding a new system variable. The variable should be Advixi Experimental, and the value should be Roofline. On Linux command line, it's as simple as typing export advixi experimental equals roofline. Secondly, you'll need to make sure your project properties are set correctly. Namely, you'll need to be sure that the flops checkbox is ticked in the trip counts tab. If you're collecting on the command line, just add the flops and masks option to your trip counts collection command. Remember, you need to use the same project directory for both the survey and trip counts commands. Now, with setup out of the way, we're going to start by running Advisor's roofline analysis on the G4 SOA loop. Roofline is not actually a separate data collection type. It's just running the survey collection immediately followed by the trip counts collection, but you only have to push the button once, which is nice. We now see the new roofline feature. It shares its tab with the survey report. 
you can toggle back and forth between them by clicking the sidebar. You could also click the ribbon to view both of them side by side. Click it again to return to toggle mode. All of the filters that apply there, such as the buttons that show and hide vectorized or unvectorized loops, work here too. It can be quite helpful in real-world programs, which tend to be a cluttered mess of dots, unlike this sample code where the loops are neat and organized. We should also check the Use Single-Threaded Roofs checkbox, since this is a single-threaded program. And finally, we should change some settings. We're only using double precision variables in this program, so the single precision roofs are irrelevant. Let's turn those off. And I'm also going to select the uppermost memory and compute roofs, so that they stand out a little more and can be easily identified at a glance. And one more thing. Down here we have some fancy dot options. By default, Advisor changes the size and color of the loop dots to indicate how much time, relatively speaking, is spent in that loop. You spend a lot of time in the big red loops, and not so much in the little green ones. I want to apply some color coding on my own using video editing magic, so I'm going to turn this feature off to make my life a little easier. Now let's actually look at our data. Let me adjust our zoom real quick with the magnifying glass tool. This dot is the loop we just ran. As you can see, it sits at the L2 bandwidth line. This makes sense. The loop is efficiently vectorized, so we would not expect it to be bound by the scalar add peak. Group 4 is intended to demonstrate memory bandwidth binding. It uses dataset 2, where all three arrays used in its algorithm, X, YA, and YB, are 2,000 doubles long. My L1 data cache can hold about 4,000 doubles. This particular loop arranges Y as a structure of arrays, which is helpful to vector efficiency. But the result of this is that the memory layout consists of 2,000 doubles in X, 2,000 doubles in YA, and then 2,000 doubles in YB. Since we access the ith member of each array, or more accurately, the ith chunk of four doubles from each array, since my machine fits four doubles in a vector register, on the ith iteration, we're jumping around memory a lot. I'm really, really simplifying this, because cache behavior is spooky arcane sorcery. But basically, when we're in structure of array format, since the dataset doesn't fit into L1, we're bouncing around and doing a lot of loads from L2. We can address this issue by changing our data layout to array of structure of arrays. In this sample code, we'll achieve this by just uncommenting the pound defined for the next loop, G4AOSOA. Once we change our code, we have to recompile it and run another survey and trip counts collection. We'll be doing this a lot in this tutorial, so I'm going to just skip past it with video editing magic, indicated by a glow effect like this. As you can see, we're now past the L2 bandwidth line. By switching to AOSOA, we split the work into two steps, and each of those steps has a dataset that does fit into L1. So we're doing fewer L2 loads. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to explain something we'll be seeing throughout this video. The difference this time was subtle, so you probably didn't notice that the roofs moved a little bit. This is because Advisor plots the roof lines based on some quick benchmarks that it runs prior to your code. There's a lot going on on a modern computer, so there are always going to be some kind of minor environmental differences, which will cause the benchmarks to behave slightly differently from run to run. As a result, the roofs can wiggle a little bit. Don't worry about it. Let's move on. The next group is Group 3, intended primarily to demonstrate compute binding. As such, it uses Dataset 1, where all the arrays are 1,328 doubles long. We still only use X, Y, A, and Y, B, but Y also contains two padding elements we don't use, to better simulate the actual behavior differences between AOS and SOA. We won't be fully exploring these differences in this video, but the important part is that when in SOA arrangement, all of the data we actually use will fit into L1 at once. Due to having a smaller dataset and doing more operations per iteration, Group 3 has a higher arithmetic intensity than Group 4, and therefore is farther to the right. As you can see, the loop we're starting with, G3 AOS Scalar, sits under the scalar add peak, and if we look in the survey report, we can see that it is indeed a scalar loop. Shocker. The next roof of the same type tells us what we should aim for to get past our own roof, and that is to vectorize. When we turn on loop G3 AOS Vector, however, we see a rather unexpected result, which is actually due to two separate effects. First, our arithmetic intensity has changed. This is the other thing Group 3 is meant to demonstrate. As I said in the explanation of roofline basics, compiler optimizations can, in fact, mess with your algorithm, and therefore alter the arithmetic intensity. For reasons we won't get into, the compiler has decided to do so with this particular variant of the Group 3 algorithm, and none of the others. If you really want to pick apart the exact details of what the compiler did, you can always look in the Assembly tab, 
but for a quick what happened, it's generally a good idea to check the code analytics tab, especially if you're not an assembly guru. Let's just take a look at the flops panel here. For ease of comparison, I'm just going to write these numbers down in a little table. Now let's look at our vectorized loop and add those numbers to the table. We can ignore the per second metrics since we know each loop takes a different amount of time, so of course those will change. But the number of operations and the number of bytes, and therefore the arithmetic intensity, should be the same. We already know the arithmetic intensity has changed, so let's find out why. The gigaflops are the same, although the gigaflops per iteration have changed, but this makes sense because we vectorized with a vector length of 4, and 8 times 4 is 32, so that checks out. What's changed here is the number of bytes accessed, both in total and per iteration. The per iteration count can't be explained here by vectorization, since 48 times 4 is 192, not 256. This tells us the compiler did something to our memory accesses. I went ahead and checked the code analytics for the next loop, which is also vectorized but is back at the original arithmetic intensity, and that data pretty much confirms this theory. The number of accessed gigabytes is the same as our original loop, and this time the bytes per iteration is 192, which is consistent with what we'd expect from vectorizing at length 4. So the compiler definitely fiddled with our memory accesses somehow, and I have a feeling these are our culprits, because I don't see them in the trait box for any other loops in this group. The second weird thing is that we're still all the way down here, just barely past the scalar add peak. We know this dataset fits entirely into L2 at least, and even when using the AOS layout, it does enough loading from L1 that it shouldn't be sitting below the L2 bandwidth roof. From a memory binding standpoint, we should probably be somewhere around here-ish. So we know that's not what's dragging us down. The actual explanation is that while we are vectorized, we are inefficiently so, as you can see over here in the survey report. This information is also available in the code analytics tab. Simply being vectorized is not enough to break the scalar add roof. You have to be well vectorized. As it turns out, array of structures data layouts don't play well with vectorization. It has to do with stride, as shown when we run a memory access patterns analysis. Both of these loops use the AOS data layout, which results in a constant stride because we're not just reading data straight through, but jumping over the parts we don't use. We also see some blue, representing a uniform stride of zero, which I suspect is also the doing of those unpack insert instructions that messed up our data access metrics. Again, you don't see these in the rest of the loops here. Lots of uniform stride 1 once we change the data layout, but we only see the 0 here. You might technically consider changing the data layout a memory optimization, but it helps with vectorization inefficiency as well, so it's still relevant to what we're trying to accomplish here. Let's go ahead and activate loop G3 SOA vector. With our vectorization issues out of the way, we've catapulted all the way up here and promptly gotten stuck beneath the vector add peak, the next roof that affects us. We've skipped over the bandwidth roofs because, as already stated, we were never L3 bound and only partially L2 bound, which, incidentally, we just fixed by switching to SOA. Two birds, one stone. The next roof up is the FMA peak, Fused Multiply Add Instructions. These instructions result in a higher roof because they're effectively doing multiple operations at the same time. Obviously, these are somewhat situational. Not every algorithm can make use of them to overcome the vector add peak. In fact, not every algorithm or dataset can overcome the scalar add peak, or the L2 bandwidth peak, or so on. If your loop cannot safely be vectorized, for example, you won't be able to get past the scalar peak. And if your dataset is such that you're consistently missing the L1 cache and cannot rearrange your data to fix this, you'll end up stuck under the L2 bandwidth roof. It pays to determine what your particular kernel's ultimate roof is, because it's not always going to be the topmost lines. Those represent the maximum your machine is capable of, and not every program can utilize the machine's resources to the fullest. But this isn't real-world code. This is sample code. Of course I designed it so we could use FMAs. We just have to shuffle some things around a bit and voila! We're past the vector peak. That said, I do have to warn you that it's not always quite that simple, as I'll demonstrate with the last group I'll explore in this video. Group 1. The algorithm is simple with a low intensity, and it also uses dataset 1. Since we're going to start with a structure of arrays layout, we should fit entirely into L1 from the get-go. Yet G1 SOA scalar sits below the L2 bandwidth line. See, the bottleneck doesn't always correspond to the first line above your dot. In reality, any of the lines above could be the culprit. As we saw in group 3 in the inefficiently vectorized loop, even the lines below can contribute, but unless you're only just barely above them as we were, they're not your main issue, so go ahead and ignore them. As I was saying, focus on the lines above you. 
If the first line above you doesn't make logical sense as a bottleneck, just keep working your way up, using the rest of Advisor's features and your familiarity with your program to inform your investigation. Now, when it comes to fitting in caches, I must make a disclaimer here. It's not always as simple as just having however many bytes of data. Other things can affect it. Cache line affinity, data alignment, and so on. But as we're working with sample code that was carefully designed and calibrated to behave a certain way with my caches, you can take my word for it. This data set in a structure of arrays format, which we're using, definitely fits into L1. So we know we're not L2 bandwidth bound. The next roof is the scalar add peak. And as you probably already guessed from the name, this loop is in fact scalar. This is our problem roof, and we can confirm it by activating G1 SOA vector, which does indeed get us past the scalar add peak. We've pretty much reached the uppermost line for this arithmetic intensity. Maybe we could squeeze a little closer to it with some additional optimizations like data alignment and such, but we're basically done here. But I would like to expand on what I said earlier about not every algorithm being able to use every optimization. Group 2, which I did not explore in this video, is very similar to Group 1, which is actually why I didn't cover it. It has a slightly higher arithmetic intensity than Group 1, and is also ultimately bound by the L1 bandwidth roof. So there's little point in introducing FMAs to it, even though the algorithm is compatible with them. It's an example of an algorithm that technically could implement an optimization, but would get no benefit from it. Group 1, on the other hand, literally cannot implement FMAs, since it's just adding two numbers together. If this algorithm had higher arithmetic intensity, it would be our inability to use FMAs that would cause our ultimate roof to be the vector add peak. It's an example of an algorithm that is incapable of implementing an optimization, whether it could benefit from it or not. You have to be able to adapt your understanding of the roofline graph to your code, as illuminated by the rest of the tools Advisor provides. The roofline doesn't give you all the answers, but it puts you in the ballpark and provides guidance on how to optimize your program, and now you know how to read it to get faster code, faster.